Hi guys, this is the Edexcel A-Level Maths Paper 3 from the June 2019 series and in this video we will be taking a look at the mechanic section only and in the description and the comments I have a link to the solutions to the statistics paper so if you haven't checked that out already please go on ahead and uh, check that out but before we get into this paper, let's just take a quick overview uh, of the, um, the examiner's report, okay? So, overall, in terms of the paper, um, there were mixed responses with regards to this paper. There, have, there may have been some evidence of time being a limiting factor since some questions seemed rushed or unfinished although it is difficult to be sure whether time or ability was the main issue here i think i think a lot of people might have answered the statistics question uh, the, the, the statistics question paper completely first and then realized that um they, they run out of uh, time answering the mechanics question so um, i can't remember how long the paper exactly is but make sure that you dedicate half the time for mechanics and half the time for statistics okay so if you're doing a statistics paper make sure that you finish the statistics paper within that time limit and if you don't just move on to the mechanics paper um in other statements what else could be said um in calculations the numerical value of g which should be used is 9.8 unless otherwise stated final answers should be given to two or three significant figures more accurate answers will be penalized including fractions but exact multiples of g are usually accepted that's something quite important if there is a printed answer to show then candidates need to ensure that they show sufficient detail in their working to warrant being awarded all the all of their marks available um, candidates should show sufficient working to make their method clear to the examiner and correct answers without working may not score all or indeed any of the marks available so make sure you show early working and if a candidate runs out of space in which to give his or her answer then he or she sh is advised to use a supplementary sheet so just grab extra paper from the examiner they should give it you question one in this question position vectors are given relative to a fixed origin O and here we have at time t seconds where t is greater or equal to zero a particle p moves th so that its velocity v meters per second is given by v equals 6t in the i component and minus 5t to the power of 3 over 2 in the j component and when t equals zero the position vector of p is minus 20i plus 20j meters and for part a we have to find the acceleration of p when t equals 4 so for part a first of all differentiating the velocity function gives the acceleration function so the acceleration a this is found by differentiating with respect to t the velocity so we wish to differentiate the velocity over here we wish to differentiate 6t i minus 5t to the power of 3 over 2 j and if we do so you'd find the acceleration function to equal 6i so that's the derivative of 6t and differentiating minus 5t to the 3 over 2 remember we multiply by the power and then subtract one from the power so we have minus 15 over 2 t to the power of one half in the j component okay and we wish to find the acceleration of p when t equals 4 
So when t is equal to 4, um, if we substitute this back into our acceleration function, we have the acceleration which is equal to 6i minus 15 over 2 times by 4 to the power of 1 half in the j component. So as a vector, we end up with 6i minus 15j, okay, meters per second squared. So that's our answer. And now for part b, we have to find the position vector of p when t equals 4. Now to find the position vector, we would have to integrate the velocity function to find the function for the position vector. So r, that's equal to the integral of the velocity with respect to time. So we integrate the velocity function with respect to time. So we have the integral of 6t in the i component and minus 5t to the power of 3 over 2 in the j component and we integrate this with respect to t. So you'd find r to be equal, integrating 6t, we have 3t squared, and integrating minus 5t to the power of 3 over 2, we end up with minus 2t to the 5 over 2 in the j component. And then we have a constant of integration, r naught we'll call this. And the reason I say R0 is because we know that when t equals 0, we have this position vector minus 20i plus 20j, which essentially is our R0. So we have R equals 3t squared in the i component minus 2t to the 5 over 2 in the j component, and then we have this extra term minus 20i plus 20j. Okay, and if we tidy all this up a bit, you'd find r to equal 3t squared minus 20 in the i component, and in the j component, we have 20 minus 2t to the 5 over 2. Okay, and we wish to find the position vector of p when t equals 4. And so when t is equal to 4, if we substitute t equals 4 into this general form over here, you'd find r to equal 3 times by 4 squared minus 20 in the i component, and in the j component, we have 20 minus 2 times by 4 to the power of 5 over 2. Okay? And therefore, you'd find r to equal 28i minus 44j meters. Okay? In terms of what can be said about question 1, um, obviously you can read through the full examiner reports itself, but expression was integrated over the fact, or the fact that it was a vector just ignored with the coefficients of i and j being added. However, such instances were relatively rare. Let's just take a look at what we did. If we go back. Um, yeah, so what we seem to do is perfectly fine. Um, in terms of what else can be said, um, some went on to calculate the magnitude, which is not actually required, but here, yeah, but generally the marks had already been achieved for a correct vector. Some candidates worked in column vectors throughout and some in i and j components. Both are equally acceptable. That's quite an interesting thing to know. In terms of part e, the mi a minority attempted to use SUVAP formally to solve the problem despite having used calculus in part a. Let's see what I did. Yeah, I just used calculus instead.
Question 2. A particle P moves with constant acceleration 2i minus 3j meters per second squared and at time t equals 0 the particle is at the point A and is moving with velocity minus i plus 4j meters per second and at time t equals capital T seconds P is moving in the direction of vector 3i minus 4j. So I think the important thing over here is to notice that p is moving in the in the direction of 3i minus 4j. So what does this mean? Well it means that essentially when t equals capital T the velocity is equal to some multiple of 3i minus 4j. In other words the ratio of i's to j's is equal to 3 to minus 4. Okay? And the reason for that is because we're moving in a direction. Okay? Hence, for part here, when we come to find out the value of t, well, first of all, we've been given the acceleration a. And this is equal to 2i minus 3j. Okay. And we can find out the velocity vector by integrating the acceleration vector with respect to t. And the reason we want to do that is because here we have some sort of a velocity. So we want to integrate the vector 2i minus 3j with respect to t and doing so you'd find the velocity to equal 2t in the i direction and minus 3j for the other component and then of course we have a constant v0 and the reason I said v0 again is because we know that at time t equals 0 we've got this velocity over here. Hence, we've got the velocity as 2ti. Sorry, here we had um, 3tj. And then we have minus 3tj. And then we add on this minus i plus 4j. Okay? And if we gather the i and j components, in conclusion, the velocity, well, that's given by 2t minus 1 in the i component and 4 minus 3t in the j component. And if we use the fact that the for the, velo uh, for the velocity, the ratio of the i to j component says 3 to minus 4, we can then form some sort of an equation. So we have i to j equaling 3 to minus 4. So we have 4 minus 3 capital T. And the reason I say capital T is because this ratio is true when T equals capital T. So we have 4 minus 3 capital T um, divided by 2T minus 1 and this is obviously equal to minus 4 over 3. And if we rearrange and solve for t, we have 3 lots of 4 minus 3t equals minus 4 lots of 2t minus 1. So we have 12 minus 9t equals minus 8t plus 4. Of course, rearranging, you'd find t to equal 8. And now for part B, at time t equals 4 seconds, B is at the point, sorry, P is at the point B, and we have to find the distance AB. Well, initially, the particle starts at A, and that's when t equals 0. And then we can use our SUVA equations to find out the position vector when the particle is at B. And if we go to the formula book, 
under the mechanics section somewhere we will be using over here um, if I grab a highlighter we will be using s equals ut plus a half at squared okay let's just highlight this okay so this is the vector uh, sorry this is the formula we will be using so now for part b using s equals ut plus one half at squared we have s equals u the initial velocity which we should know is minus i plus 4j that's when t equals zero so we have minus i plus 4j multiplied by t plus one half times by the acceleration the acceleration is given by 2i minus 3j so we have a half lots of 2i minus 3j and then we multiply this by t squared and now when t is equal to 4 substituting t equals 4 into this over here we have s equals minus i plus 4j times by 4 plus one half times by 2i minus 3j multiplied by 4 squared and if we work this out you'd find s to equal 12i minus 8j meters and this is the position of b okay and therefore if it starts from point a when t equals zero by the time it reaches b when t equals four seconds we have this over here and therefore the distance a b hopefully you can recognize that's 12 squared plus minus 8 squared square rooted which is 4 root 13 okay in terms of question 2 um, the most common error was equating the equating rather than either equating the ratios of components or equating to a multiple of 3i minus 4j a fair number attempted to use a displacement vector showing a lack of understanding of the situation the second part was generally handled more successfully with many correct answers seen for the displacement vector so using s equals ut plus a half at squared although not all proceeded to find the distance by calculating its magnitude in terms of what else can be said use of magnitudes of vectors throughout and some invalid multiplication slash division of vectors were seen on occasion. Question three, two blocks A and B of masses 2m and 3m respectively are attached to the ends of a light string. And we see the string over here. Initially, A is held at rest on a fixed rough plane and the plane is inclined at an angle alpha to the horizontal ground where tan alpha equals 5 over 12 and the string passes over a small smooth pulley p fixed at the top of the plane as we see over here and the part of the string from a to p is parallel to a line of greatest slope of the plane block b hangs freely below p as shown in figure one the coefficient of friction between a and the plane is two thirds so from here mu is equal to two thirds and the blocks are released from rest with the string tor and a moves up the plane the tension in the string immediately after the blocks are released is t the blocks are modeled as particles and the string is modeled as being inextensible for part a we have to show that t equals 12 mg over 5 well, I think it would help if we add our forces, etc., to this diagram, which I will do now. So, we have over here, if we consider A, we have the reaction force. We've got the friction force here, because the plane is rough. We've got the weight component, and we've got the components of those weights here, 
parallel to the plane we've got 2mg sine alpha perpendicular to the plane we've got 2mg cos alpha and then obviously we've got the tension in the string and then if we consider b we've got the weight pulling down 3mg and we've got the tension pointing upwards t okay and we wish to find out what t is in terms of m and g presumably and we can do this by first of all finding out the reaction force of a and that's equal to this if we resolve perpendicular to the plane that's equal to 2 mg cos alpha so for part a the reaction force of a that's equal to 2 mg times by the cosine of alpha and if we find out the friction force acting resolving parallel to the plane we've got the tension going up because remember a is moving upwards so opposing that tension we've got fa and we've also got the well actually before we do that let's actually define what fa is fa is equal to mu r so fa equals mu times by r a we knew we know mu to be two thirds so we have two thirds times by r a so we multiply this by 2 mg cos alpha so we have four thirds mg cos alpha okay and if we use f equals m a then going forwards we've got the tension and opposing that we've got the friction force and this component of the weight 2 mg sine alpha okay so if we use f equals ma that's the sum of the forces equals the mass times by the acceleration then we have if we consider a we've got t minus 2 mg sine alpha minus 4 thirds mg cos alpha and this is equal to the mass 2m multiplied by the acceleration a okay and what we can now do is if we go back to what we were given in the question we know that tan alpha is equal to 5 over 12 so from this we can form this triangle over here so if we know that the tangent of an angle is equal to the opposite over the adjacent we have the opposite 5 over the adjacent 12 and therefore from this using Pythagoras we can find the hypotenuse to be 13 and from this we can find sine alpha to be 5 thirteenths cos alpha to be 12 thirteenths and tan alpha to be 5 twelfths and if we substitute sine alpha and cos alpha back into what we have over here we have t minus 2 mg times by sine alpha so we multiply this by 5 over 13 minus 4 thirds mg times by cosine of alpha so we have to multiply by 12 over 13 and this is equal to 2 ma and if we do a bit of simplifying we have t minus 10 over 13 mg minus here we have um, 4 12 times by 3 over 13 which simplifies to 16 over 13 so we have 16 over 13 mg and this is equal to 2 ma and combining these together we have t minus 2 mg equals 2 ma okay hopefully that should be straightforward and if we call this equation 1 if we now consider the motion of b we've got the weight pulling down and opposing that we've got this tension so using again the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times by the acceleration we have minus t that's opposing the box and then we've got the 3mg pulling it down and this is equal to 3ma we'll call this equation 2 and if we solve the equation 1 and equation 2 simultaneously by 
adding them together. So um, if we add together equation 1 and equation 2, you'd find over here that the t's cancel and minus 2mg plus 3mg, that's 1mg, and 2ma plus 3ma, that's 5ma. The m's cancel on both sides, from which you can hopefully see the acceleration is equal to g over 5 meters per second squared. Okay? And if we now substitute this a back into equation 1, we have t minus 2mg equals 2m times by g over 5. And if we tidy all this up a bit, we have 2 fifths plus 2, that would be 12 over 5. So we have t equaling 12 over 5 mg newtons, which is what we wanted to show. Now for part b, after b reaches the ground, a continues to move up the plane until it comes to rest before reaching p. And we have to determine whether a will remain at rest, carefully justifying your answer. Well, for this part, if we go back over here to the diagram, you'd notice over here, the if B stops moving and A continues to move, what pushes the particle A upwards will be the friction force. And the only thing that opposes that is the weight force, because that's the only way A can move. So hopefully that makes sense. And of course we know that the we know what the friction force is i think from top of my head that was 16 over 3 uh, 16 over 13 mg and we've also got the weight force over here that would be 10 over 13 mg so let's just draw a quick diagram to illustrate what's going on so we've got the 16 over 13 mg moving upwards so perhaps if we illustrate this like this and uh, we've got the 10 over 13 mg opposing it and therefore a will not move because it's essentially this frictional force is greater than the uh, resistance force that pushes it back so therefore um, we can conclude from here that a will not move okay let's just write that down a will not move and now for part c we have to suggest two refinements to the model that would make it more realistic. Well, um, for part C, two things we can do. We can consider this an extensible string. And we can also consider the friction of the pulley. Okay. In terms of question three, um, there were a lot of people who resolved incorrectly. Um, in terms of what else can be said, there were common errors um, in inconsistency of the use or the loss of m, including an extra g in the acceleration term of forgetting to include a g in their weight. So when you've got weight, make sure you include g. Um, it was surprising how many candidates simply wrote t equals 12 mg over 5 at the end of their incorrect working assuming it would not be checked so make sure you show your full working um, in part b many candidates try to describe what would happen without any supporting calculations many talked about the continued motion of it ignoring the actual question others simply said that it would continue moving as b has more mass than a ignoring the effects of the plane and in terms of what else can be said a few candidates showed a deeper understanding of the problem and simply compared mu and tan alpha some candidates did not, did not notice that the terms required were available from the question of motion of, for A. Some candidates did not re read the question carefully and considered what happened immediately after B reached the ground rather than when the block A came to rest. In terms of what else can be said, a minority showed their lack of understanding by using tension in their explanation and the final part was generally well done, although some candidates were persistent in giving more answers than are required which often means that they include a wrong one and so lose marks. So that's be 
that's quite important make sure that you include make sure that you you have a clear distinct answer don't include more than what you need to put because you might lose marks question four a ramp a b of length eight meters and mass 20 kilograms rests in equilibrium with end a on a rough horizontal ground and the ramp rests on a on a solid um, on a smooth solid cylinder drum which is partially which is partly under the ground the drum is fixed with its axis at the same horizontal level as a as we see here and the point of contact between the ramp and the drum is c over here where ac equals five meters as shown in figure two now if the ramp ab is eight meters of course cb is three meters as shown here the ramp is resting in a vertical plane which is perpendicular to the axis of the drum at an angle theta to the horizontal where tan alpha uh, tan theta equals 7 over 24 and the ramp is modeled as a uniform rod we have to explain why the reaction from the drum on the ramp at point c acts in a direction which is perpendicular to the ramp well we were told somewhere that the drum is smooth over here and therefore we've got no friction and therefore the reaction is perpendicular to the drum let's just put that down into words so we see that the drum is smooth so we have no friction so no and, and so the reaction is perpendicular to the ramp now for part b we have to find the magnitude of the resultant force on the ramp at the point a so i've drawn this diagram well i've added the forces and the relevant information given we know that tan theta is equal to 7 over 24 so from this we can work out the hypotenuse which is 25 using pythagoras and so sine theta is equal to 7 over 25 cos theta is equal to 24 over 25 and tan theta is equal to 7 over 24 and we've got these different components of the normal at c the weight which is four meters along here so maybe if we add this here we've got four meters here and four meters here and um, we've got the reaction at a and we've got the friction at the point a as well okay and the reason for that is because some of we were told that the ground is rough now for us to find the magnitude of the resultant force the resultant force is well if we've got this r over here and this f over here perhaps if i add this f over here then the resultant force is shown in gray over here okay and obviously it can be in the opposite direction that just depends on whether r and or f are positive so first of all if we take moments about a that will eliminate the forces about a and we'll end up with an equation in terms of n so if we take moments about a let's just write this down so if we take moments about a we've got over here um we've got this four cos theta meters and then we've got the force perpendicular 20g and this is equal to 5n okay actually there's a wrong way of thinking about it we've got over here the um we've got the uh, the 20g over here and we've got this um four meters over here and then we've got this normal reaction five meters and therefore if we take moments about here we've got 20g times by 4 cos theta and this is equal to 5n so hopefully that makes sense so the 5 refers to the distance n is the force the perpendicular force now we know that cos theta is equal to if we go back 24 over 25 so we've got 20g times by 4 lots of 24 over 25 and this is equal to 5n and if we solve for n you'd find over here n to equal 384g over 25 okay 
And if we resolve horizontally now, we've got n sine theta that's shown in orange over here, and that's equal to f. So if we resolve horizontally, you'd find we get f equals n times by sine theta. We know that sine theta is equal to 7 over 25. We already know what n is, we've just found that here. So f is equal to n, 384g over 25, multiplied by uh, sine theta, which is 7 over 25. Okay, and if we work this result out, you'd find f to equal 2688g over 625. And now if we resolve vertically this time, we've got this r over here, and then we've got this n cos theta, that's shown in orange, and that's equal to this 20g in the opposite direction. So if we now resolve vertically, you'd find over here we have r plus n cos theta equals 20g. And therefore, we have r plus 384g over 25, that's n. And then we multiply this by cos theta, which was 24 over 25. And this is equal to 20g. From which we can see r is equal to 3284g. Over 625. Okay, and therefore, if we wish to find the resultant force, we'd have to be using Pythagoras. So, therefore, the resultant force we've got over here r squared, so we have 3284g over 625 squared plus. Um, the f squared, so we have 2688g over 625 squared, and then we square root this. And you'd find the resultant force is 66.5 newtons, okay? So if you put this into your calculator with g equaling 9.81, you'd find this result over here. Now for part c, we have to, well here we have that the ramp is still in equilibrium in the position shown in figure 2, but the ramp is now not modelled as being uniform. Given that the centre of mass of the ramp is assumed to be closer to A than to B, we have to state how this would affect the magnitude of the normal reaction between uh, the ramp and the drum. Well, if the centre of mass is closer to A, then it would be then the normal reaction would decrease to keep it in equilibrium. So let's just write that down. So the magnitude of the normal reaction at C will decrease to keep it in equilibrium. In terms of question 4, uh, many seem to think that a reaction is, by definition, at right angles to the surface. Very few recognise the significance of the drum being smooth with the consequence that there is no frictional force and hence only a normal component of the reaction. The second part involved finding the components of the resultant force on the ramp at the point of contact with the ground and hence its magnitude. This proved challenging for many and some made little, of little valid progress. A clearly labelled diagram would have helped to identify forces and distances. Most used a normal reaction and a horizontal frictional force at A. However, the latter was sometimes omitted, which significantly reduced the number of marks available for subsequent equations. Some employed components parallel and perpendicular to the ramp. Such attempts were rare, but generally successful. In terms of what else can be said, um, working was often difficult to decipher. Those who attempted vertical and horizontal resolutions and a moments about a equation tended to, do the more, tended to be the more successful, although a significant number stopped when they had found 
the normal reaction only. Some introduced a coefficient of a coefficient which was not necessarily to answer the question. Um, there were other things about people failing to achieve the final accuracy mark for not rounding to two or three significant figures following the use of g equals 9.8 meters per second. And then you can read the rest for this part of the question. Question 5. The points A and B lie 50 metres apart on a horizontal ground as we see here, and at time t equals 0, two small balls, P and Q, are projected in, a verti in the vertical plane containing AB. Ball P is projected from A with speed 20 metres per second at 30 degrees to AB, as we see here, and ball Q is projected from B with the speed u metres per second. Now I'm going to write this as capital U, and um, the reason I'm doing that is for a later part in the question. Uh, anyway, this is at an angle theta to B A, as shown in figure 3. At time t equals 2 seconds, P and Q collide. Until they collide, the balls are modelled as particles moving freely under gravity. For part A, we have to find the velocity of P at the instant before the ball, uh, at the instant before it collides with Q. Well, initially, so let's write this down, initially, We know that the velocity is given by um, 20 meters per second, and in terms of the components, the if we consider um, uh, p, um, sorry, at the point a, well, rather this should be um, the the initial velocity of p horizontally is equal to 20 cos 30 and because there's no acceleration this is not changing so the horizontal component does not change because there's no acceleration and if we consider the vertical component of the initial velocity that would be 20 sine 30 and this would change of course here we have meters per second. Okay, and if we use the formula v equals u plus at, that's here, using that, so using v equals u plus at, let's write this down, of course we will be using this formula vertically, and the reason we're considering this vertically is because once we've found out the vertical component we already know that the horizontal component won't change and we can use that to find the speed when t equals two seconds so the vertical speed and the the vertical speed of p will equal our initial vertical speed 20 sine 30 and then we have then we have 80, so we have 9.8 times by t. And don't forget the minus because we treat upwards as positive. You'd find we get minus 9.6 meters per second. So what does this mean? If we quickly draw this out, we've got our vertical speed over here, which is, sorry, we've got our horizontal speed, which is 20 um, cos 30. Then we've got our vertical bit over here, 9.6, and notice it goes down. So maybe if we add on arrows like this, and then here we've got the overall speed, which we're going to find out now. So working that out, the speed will equal by Pythagoras. 20 cos 30 squared plus minus uh, plus minus 9.6 squared and if we work this out you'd find we get 19.803 etc meters per second and in terms of the angle because i think we were supposed to find the angle too perhaps the angle would be this angle over here 
which is equal to the inverse tangent of 9.6 over 20 cos 30. And if we work this out, you'd find we get a value of approximately 29 degrees below the horizontal. Okay? So now for part B, we have to find the size of the angle theta and the value of u. Okay, now over here, we will be using the formula s equals ut plus a half at squared. And the reason before I put a capital u was to not confuse it with this little u. So for part B, using s equals ut plus a half at squared, we can use this horizontally and vertically to find out what u is. Now, if you think about it, the sum of the velocities horizontally will equal 50. And that's both the contribution from p and q. So, horizontally, if we consider the motion horizontally, Horizontally, you'll find that there's no acceleration. And therefore, S is equal to UT. So we have 50, that's the total horizontal distance. And this is equal to U. Cos theta multiplied by 2. And we also have this 2 cos 30 multiplied by 2 as well. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And you'd therefore find that u cos theta is equal to 25 minus 20 cos 30. We'll call this equation 1. And if we consider the motions vertically, the distances will be equal because essentially they both collide at as a particular height. So if we sort of sketch this out, so suppose he, here's p and here's q, the sort of what the both would collide at this point over here. So both the motion for um, P and Q will, uh, the, the distance when they collide will be the same because they collide at the same point. So vertically, if we write this down, the distances are equal. Okay, so we've got over here, if we consider P, we've got 20 sine 30 times by 2 minus a half times by G times by 2 squared. And the reason it's 2 squared is because somewhere we were told that at 2 seconds they collide. And this will equal the same thing for Q. U sine theta multiplied by 2, so this is the UT bit minus a half at squared, so we have a half times by g times by 2 squared, and happily these terms cancel out. So what we're left with is u sine theta equals 20 sine 30. We'll call this equation 2. And if we solve the equation 1 and 2 simultaneously, we can solve them simultaneously by dividing them by each other. So we have u sine theta over u cos theta, and this is equal to 20 sine 30 over 25 minus 20 cos 30. So the u's cancel, and we're left with tan theta, because sine theta over cos theta is tan theta, and on the right hand side we have 1.302 etc. And therefore theta is equal to 52.47 etc degrees. And if we look at equation 2 we can now find out what u is. So from equation 2 we can see that u is equal to 20 sine 30 over sine theta. And we know that theta is equal to 52. So therefore, 
we see that u is equal to 20 sine 30 divided by sine of 52.47 etc you'd find u to equal 12.608 etc meters per second and now for part c we have to state one limitation of the model other than air resistance that could affect the accuracy of our answers so for this part um, one thing that could affect our answers is that the model does not take into account the spin of the ball okay so probably that's the end of the paper in terms of question five some things we can mention of those who found the horizontal and vertical components of the velocity only a proportion proceeded to calculate the speed and of those very few found the direction this is despite the clear lead from the question which had given each velocity as a speed with direction in terms of what else we can say a sizable minority broke the universal rule that answers must be given in terms of quantities which are given in the question given their velocities in terms of ing which had not been defined in this question the second part proved to be quite discriminating although a significant number of candidates did successfully find the correct values of both um, theta and u in terms of what else can be said um, a significant number, uh, number lost the mark by referring to the mass or weight and some referred to air resistance even though the question specified other than air resistance